Good morning, everyone. We're just going to give it a minute or so to let people join and then we'll get started. All right, welcome to the DBRS Morningstar webinar Spotlight on CRE CLOs. I'm Rich Carlson and I am head of North American CMBS surveillance and operational risk for DBRS Morningstar. I have three uh, speakers joining me today. First off, uh, Stephen Kohler, who's the vice president for the North American CMBS surveillance group, and he's going to start us off with a discussion on what we have seen uh, in surveillance and some CRE CLO stats. Uh, then we'll move on to John Amon. John is a senior vice president in the North American CMBS new issuance team. And he's going to provide some color on uh, recent collateral values and performance. And then finally, we uh, have a special guest star today. We have Pat Sargent, who's partner in the finance group at Alston and Bird, and he's going to lead a discussion on structural issues and features in CRE CLOs. Uh, just a, a few reminders. Uh, first of all, uh, there you can submit questions through the through the app, and we will do our best to either answer the questions throughout the presentation, or if we have time at the end. Or of course, if we don't answer your question, feel free to follow up with us directly. Um, and then just one of the questions always is, uh, will the slide deck be available? And the answer to that is yes, along with uh, a, a replay um, that will come from the business development team. So uh, if we wanted to pull up the slide deck, I'm gonna hand it over to Stephen Kohler and Stephen can kick us off. Excellent, thank you, Rich. So uh, if we move on to the next slide, I thought, you know, we'd hit the Wayback Machine and, you know, back to 2020 and take a look at what the universe uh, consisted of, you know, prior to the onset of the pandemic. So this is just a real brief slide and we won't spend too much time on um, the universe uh, from a year ago, but you can see, you know, 57 deals um, totaling 30, over 32 billion. And you can see the breakdown between the managed transactions and the static transactions. And then no surprise here, the most prevalent property type um, co composing these transactions were multifamily uh, at 44%. And then I thought it, it'd be interesting to note too that the average loan size for the multifamily loans was $17 million. Um, and then you can see the the other property types, which of note, I, I just want to draw everyone's eyes to the concentrations of uh, office, retail, hotel, as we kind of know um, where we sit today, that those have likely changed. So we'll touch on that in, in a minute or so. Um, but if we can um, go to the next slide. I also wanted to quickly go over, you know, what did this, the especially service concentration look like throughout the uh, CRE, CRE CLO universe? And you know, there's not a whole lot here. Like you look at these two photos here and combine that is eight loans totaling $65.6 .6 million. So that is a minuscule special servicing rate of 0.2%. And then in regards to loans that had been modified, excuse me, that you know was a grand total of 15 loans and um, $387 million. So not a lot of activity. Um, as we know, the market was doing quite well. Borrowers were achieving their business plans and being able to get to take out financing. So, yeah, I think that tracks pretty well with uh, how just the overall CMBS market was uh, performing in 2020 as well, wouldn't you say, Stephen? Yes. So, yeah, there, there's no discernible difference between you know the traditional conduit market and the CRE CLO market, they kind of were performing uh, in lockstep and, you know, at times, times were good <laughs> ahead of yeah. uh, April 2020. Okay, and then uh, how do things look currently? So if we move to the next slide, 
now we're going to look at the entire universe as of April 2021 reporting. So you can see that transaction volume has, you know, for lack of a better word, um, kind of exploded here. Um, even throughout this past year, there's been a ton of new issuance, um, a little bit more in terms of uh, static transactions uh, versus managed, but you can see we were at 32 billion and, and we've got, gone up to 44.4 billion in just over a year. And we went up, and we're now we're totaling 79 total transactions. And if you look at the, the property type distribution chart here, you can see that overall, you know, multifamily has gone up by a few points. Um, office has stayed relatively the same, but then you, you notice more so the decline in uh, retail and hotel loans being contributed to these pools. Yeah, um, interesting that the static transactions have uh, increased as far as share of overall outstanding. Um, I think in, in maybe, you know, John might cover this when, when uh, he's talking later, but I'm guessing that a lot of the static transactions were earlier in the year long period. And now I think we're definitely seeing a return to more of the managed transactions. Yeah, I think, um... Uh, Rich, in fact, we saw some deals last year, you may recall, that started off managed and moved to static as the pandemic hit in. So I think certainly the pandemic had an impact on the comfort zone of, of investors and issuers in, in going out into the market during uh, with a managed deal. So the static kind of picked up and now that seems to have reversed a bit. Yeah, I think so too. All right, Stephen, what's next? So if we go to move to the next slide, I think um, it'd be interesting to kind of look down and see, look back and see like, you know, between that period of, you know, March 2020, April 2021, what has changed? Like, are there any noticeable trends? And I, you know, I won't spend too much time on this because I don't want to take away John's thunder, but you can see here, you know, we, we touched on the, the prevalence of more static transactions versus managed, which might be reversing course. And then I wanted to point out too, you know, just within this past year, that multifamily portion we had shown in the previous slide that it you know was up three points just total throughout the entire universe but when you look at just the past 12 months roughly you can see that that multifamily portion increased um, pretty dramatically while you know your office dropped five points your hotel dropped i believe it was you know seven eight points your retail drops a couple points so when you look at those you know three property types the hotel the retail and the office that's all, all of that reduction was was eaten up um, by the multifamily. And, you know, John will kind of go into to that a little bit more um, when we, we get to his slides, but I think that's very uh, interesting to note. And then in terms of the the managed deals or, or deals with uh, ramp up periods, the demand for those has been extremely strong still. Um, just in our rated book alone, you know, we, I looked at, you know, beginning April, 2020 on forward, and we did 173 individual asset um, uh, letters sent to issuers. And that was over $4 billion of just trust debt. Uh, and 2021 alone, we've seen 79 new assets and just over 1.45 billion of trust debt. And of those loans, 55 of them were multifamily, and that was over uh, $1.08 billion of trust debt. And another thing that I found um, interesting as well is within 2021, we've also um, provided rack on four hotel assets, and those totaled over $100 million. So just trying to take a look and see maybe moving forward, are there going to be some opportunities in some of these property types that have been hit, you know, really hard the last um, year, those being, you know, the hotel and the retail. Yeah, no, it's definitely been busy. Hey, Stephen, could you give a little overview since you're kind of like the relationship manager with the collateral managers and the issuers as far as what we do, you know, when we provide a rack letter, what's the process? Could you give an overview so folks know all the work that we put into uh, reviewing these assets? Oh, of course. Yeah, so, you know, we'll, we'll get the request from the issuer and we'll do a full um, underwriting of the loan, um, same exact process as we do at uh, issuance of a, of a new transaction. So we'll do our, our due diligence, we'll, we'll model the loan in the context of the, the pool, um, make sure there's no rating implications. And then if the, uh, the fully funded uh, first mortgage 
alone is you know above four percent of the transaction balance we're actually uh, composing what i like to term as a, a mini pre-sale that we're uh, putting on the dbr's viewpoint platform and so this is going to include uh, information regarding the asset the loan the business plan uh, the dbrs morning star um, stabilized net cash flow summary and then a an opinion of the the business plan um, that we provide on our website so i think it's you know important for everyone to know that there's a, a good level of in-depth work going on behind the scenes for these it's not just a, a rubber stamp we're looking at every single one and then the bigger loans we're also providing additional commentary and analysis great yeah so okay so here's like the new loans what about how are uh how have the loans been performing over the past year so if you jump to the next slide and these are these are kind of going to work in concert these next uh three slides so this is the specially serviced loans uh, distribution as of April 2021 20, reporting. So you can see we had what eight loans a year ago. And now we've got 62 loans. The the outstanding balance has increased tenfold from 65 to 670 million. So uh, that special servicing rate has jumped to 1.6 percent. Obviously, that sounds like a lot from 0.2 to 1.6. But when you look at that, in, you know, in comparison with the traditional CMBS conduit market, you know, that still pales in comparison. And so this first chart here uh, is just showing the property type distribution. And obviously on your um, left vertical axis, you've got the outstanding uh, loan balance. And then on the right, you've got your loan count. So uh, no surprise here that, you know, hotel is, is, the, is the highest in terms of outstanding balance and uh, loan count and you know followed up by office and then i think you know multifamily in general is performing quite well but just given that you've got yeah. you know what was it 47 percent of the outstanding universe now is made up of um, multifamily loans by outstanding balance that you are going to have a little bit of multifamily um, property uh, special servicing transfers as well so if you jump to the the next slide this shows the distribution by um, payment status. So, you know, you're looking at this and uh, what do we make of this? It's just showing that, you know, the different uh, statuses and the loan count, but, you know, I, I've looked into the stats a little bit and you can kind of, you know, delve into these and um, manipulate them a little bit just to find out if there's any patterns. And so for the, the non-performing matured balloons out of that entire balance, um, You've got 11 office loans, um, that's $100 million. Most of those are located in suburban locations, which we classify as um, properties with the DBRS Morningstar market rank, ranging between three and five. Um, you've got five hotel loans, um, that's $150 million by UPB. However, that's kind of, um, there's an outlier with one of those loans, it's $100 million. And so that's a full service, the rest of those um, are, are um, actually, I take that back. There, there are um, a couple of full full service, a couple of limited service, but that one full service, you know, is in an urban market, while the others are in suburban. Um, when you look at the delinquencies of the 90 to 120 days, and then over 121 days, um, surprisingly, you have um, four multifamily loans. Um, that's that total 65 million dollars, including a property in Manhattan, and then you've got a few hotel loans and one of those is in um, South Beach in Miami and then another is a, an airport hotel so obviously demand um, would have you know declined uh, significantly at you know at airports throughout the country and then when you look at the, the current bucket you've got um, five hotel loans those are all suburban uh, hotels and they're all uh, limited service or extended stay so I think that's the, a narrative that you know, we've been hearing is that those hotels um, have, have been doing better than the full service hotels throughout the country, whether it was suburban or, or urban markets. Um, and then you've got some form, you've got mixed use properties as well. And those all have a uh, retail components. So, you know, not the entire uh, cash flow for those properties is derived from the retail, but just a little bit. So it seems like those borrowers are still able to keep those loans current. 
Great. So, um, you know, yeah, uh, it, I guess not surprising that uh, non-performing matured would take up a lot of the um, the real estate here in special servicing, mainly because of you know some of the structural features of these loans that allow them to you know it's expected that they're not going to be cash flowing at you know a certain level so you know the challenge is if you get to your final extension and you're not able to refi out so that i guess that makes sense um what have we seen i i'm assuming that there have been corrected loans and and what are we seeing there yeah so um if we move to the next slide and i'll kind of quickly just touch on this before we get to the corrected loans or a little um, oh, out of order there, but no, it's completely fine. So this just shows here that there's really no delineation between market rank, like where um, assets are located, whether they're in you know suburban or, or urban locations. So the urban being the market rank six, seven, and eight, you know, no, the pandemic affected properties and borrowers wherever they were located. So um, there's really not a, an over arching narrative on this. I just wanted to kind of reiterate that with this slide. So we can move to the, the next, uh, which I think is going to be quite interesting. So this is what we're terming corrected loans. Um, we're not calling these modified loans because you know that has a, a specific definition. And, and I'll touch on that um, as I wrap up in, in a few minutes. But so th well, these are corrected loans. So this is these are loans where the servicer performs some sort of uh, action to aid the borrower um, throughout the last year. And so we, you see you've got 161 loans totaling just under 3.5 billion. Um, that equates to a rate of 8%. Again, very similar narrative with the property type distribution. Um, no surprise, you've got hotel leading the way, um, followed by office and, the, and then multifamily bringing, um, coming in third. And the next slide, similar to how we were discussing the specially serviced uh, payment status. This is kind of the, the workout status as reported um, in the monthly investor reporting packages. So um, for, forbearance buying away is the largest. Um, again, not a huge surprise. Um, within forbearance, you've got you had 26 hotel loans totaling you know, $540 million. You've got a little bit of multifamily You've got 13 retail loans, totaling 200 million. And then that second bucket here, um, the other. So looking through the, the comments in the files, like what does other mean, right? It's kind of you know a catch-all, which sometimes that doesn't really inform us as, as readers, like what does that mean? So reading the comments, the others um, designation, that basically consisted of allowing borrowers to access existing reserves to um, pay their debt service, um, allowing borrowers to defer or waive ongoing reserve deposits, um, allowing borrowers to apply and receive um, funding from federal programs such as the, the PPP and um, just other agreements in general. And then when you kind of hear those definitions, again, you're no surprise that hotel um, properties were, were leading the way with uh, 26 loans totaling over $600 million. And then the last part here, the, the maturity aid extension, um, similar to how we'd shown the, the non-performing loans had a, had a pretty sizable office concentration. Um, the maturity date extension here, um, that made up 12 uh, office loans totaling just under $500 million. So over 50% of, of that bucket as well. And then, the following slide here again kind of shows that it doesn't necessarily matter where your properties are. If, if the borrowers needed assistance, um, the, by and large, you know the servicer is going to work with them to to um, get assistance and and help you know get the loan back on track. All right, that that's uh, definitely. Uh, interesting. And, you know, I think one other thing to add with the other bucket that you were talking about, a lot of times it's a combination of some of the other things that, you know, get classified into uh, other just for convenience sake. Um, so uh, what takeaways do you have, Stephen? Any other final thoughts? Yes, uh, I've got a few actually. So um, something that, you know, we didn't talk about are the, the interest coverage ratio and, and the par value tests. You know, I think 
mentioning that we're calling these corrected loans versus modified loans, that's kind of where the, the definition is important because today there's been no um, triggers that have been breached, which you know would make it so uh, issuers could, not, could no longer um, to use the reinvestment periods, um, there'd be high parameterization of the bond. So none of that has happened to date. There, there have been no realized losses to date. And then another hot topic are the, the loan buyouts at par. So these transactions allow issuers to buy out um, non-performing loans or delinquent loans at par and, re and replace the collateral. So we looked through our rated book and there really have not been a lot many instances of this. I, I found 10 loans that had a total trust balance of 365 million. Again, not surprisingly, um, mostly hotel loans, six of those totaling over 200 million. And then um, a couple office and uh, one retail and one mixed use. And of course, of course, the mixed use that had a hotel component. So um, narrative um, kind of continues with that. Uh, and then I just kind of want to wrap up here just, you know, with um, our opinion and hypotheses on why these are performing so well in, in comparison with the traditional uh, conduit market. And I think, you know, you've, you've got several things. You've got the, the um, the acquisition financing versus refinance financing. Um, it's, an, it's approximately a two to one ratio. So if borrowers are coming in and they're putting in, you know, 20 plus percent equity down, they've got a little, they've got skin in the game right from the jump. The, you know, the business plans that are stated at issuance, there's, you know, a certain expectation that properties are going to have cash flow struggles, whether it be new construction that's in lease up or if it's, you know, pr projects that take on significant renovations and they're going to, you know, move tenants out to complete um, capital improvements and then bring them back back in. And then when you've got, you know, instances where there are, you know, um, expectations for cash flow disruptions, you're, you're also going to likely have uh, reserves at issuance, not just, you know, for the capital improvements and, and the future leasing, but, you know, operating shortfalls and debt service shortfall reserves. So the loan structure, itself helps quite a bit. And then um, the last thing I would say, you know, loans that did have issues, you know, there's, you know, an approach between the, the issuer and the borrowers that where they're trying to, to help each other, um, you know, whether it's a relationship lending, um, you know, just you know, reputation of wanting to have deals where there's low delinquency, um, you know, they want to maintain these relationships. And obviously, issuers are holding the below investment grade bonds, which, you know, are 20 plus percent of the entire deal. So I think you know, all of these motivations tend to work in concert with one another. And I think that's, those are some of the reasons why the um, delinquency rate the, has been um, pretty low overall. Yeah, I would agree with that. I think one thing also to add is that, you know, these loans are really high touch asset management that, you know, either the servicer or the um, collateral manager, they're interacting and, and looking at these loans every month and, you know, uh, keeping in touch. So I think that helps because there's definitely early warning systems and, you know, red flags are, are uh, uncovered uh, maybe earlier than you would see with a traditional conduit loan. All right. Thanks, Stephen. Um, yep, now welcome. we're going to look we're going to move forward and uh, talk with John about uh, what we're seeing in the current uh, new issuance front. Yeah, good stuff, Stephen. Thanks. Uh, so yeah, uh, let's take a look at the CRE volume so far in 2021. If we want to go to the next slide, you'll see that we've already been through 18 deals so far in mid-May. Uh, with total volume of $14.6 billion. Uh, this is a new record uh, year to date compared to historical years. So, you know, high volume right now. Uh, in 2020, we had volume of $19.2 billion. And all expectations are that we're going to actually exceed that number by the middle of this year. Um, also, CRE, CLO is, is so active that it's actually outpacing the conduit market right now. Um, it, you know, we'll see if that ends up being the case at by year end, but right now that's actually where it's at. Uh, the CLO market is, you know, definitely hitting on all cylinders. You know, we definitely have a robust origination pipeline from the issuers and there's strong, strong investor demand uh, for new issuance. 
Um, what you can see is that the deal type skews a little bit towards managed. Uh, we've got 11 of the 18 deals since the beginning of the year that are managed. And just as a reminder, um, you know, static deals, there's one, the loan pool will stay the same over the time, whereas a managed deal will allow for the reinvestment of principal proceeds into new loans subject to eligibility criteria. Um, and just another feature of managed deals is it can also include a ramp component. I know, Stephen, you mentioned that a little bit. Um, this allows the issuer to add new loans after closing during a relatively you know, short period of time that could be 90 or 100 days to achieve this target pool balance. Um, a recent trend that we're seeing with that ramp component is that there's some guardrails around that now as far as the property types that will come in through the ramp, um, generally the preference being multifamily. Uh, so in some cases, it has to be pure multifamily loans coming in or a significant portion of that. Um, that's something that we hadn't seen previously um, before COVID. If we can go to the next slide, I did wanna bring us back to kind of the current state of CRE property values. So as you can see from the, the Green Street Property Index, we did see a decline from post pandemic of about uh, a little over 10%. Um, you know, however, since the middle of 2020, you know, June, July, we've started that it kind of bottomed out and we're still, you know, we're starting to see that sort of stair stepping back up in values. Um, you know, we had, as of April, we haven't returned obviously to pre pandemic values across all property types, but we've definitely recovered a fair bit. So we're back to about a 5% decline overall across all property types. Um, so although the, you know, the, there's been a broad recovery on CRE values, it definitely hasn't been consistent across the property types. Um, kind of as Stephen had you know, highlighted, there's definitely some problematic property types. So if we can go to the next slide, I've kind of broken this down as to what the property value changes have been by property type. So, you know, clearly industrial has just skyrocketed. It's, it's doing very well, um, you know, up 20%. MHC and self-storage have, have actually done pretty well. Apartments are a little bit in the middle there with kind of modest value decline. Um, offices have definitely taken a hit. They're down 9%. Hotels are down 11%. And retail's really taking it the worst uh, with strip retail down 13% and malls down, you know, over 20%. So with those value trends in mind, I, let's take a look at the, the next slide. And what this is showing, it looks like a lot of numbers on here, but it, it's showing what the, the year to date um, CLO deals property type composition is. So you'll see multifamilies in here at about 52.5%, you know, the largest majority. Um, offices in here at about 26%. Um, and this, you know, kind of mirrors, you know, this isn't that much different than historical uh, trends as far as compositions. Um, you'll also note that there are some issuers that are pure multifamily uh, deals. So we have a couple of those in, in you know, beginning of this year uh, so far. Um, and John, and then, John yeah. those, te those tend to have the lower uh, subordinations too, as it looks like. That's right. That's correct. I know, and you know, from our modeling standpoint, uh, multifamily, um, does look, look good. And, um, you know, as we can kind of, we'll, we'll get into a little bit, just like why ultimately, um, from a transitional property standpoint, apartments actually seem to, you know, be a little bit easier to get your arms around and, um, performance has generally been pretty good. Um, one thing I wanted to note is if you look at this office component, you know, you've got 26% and there's some of these deals that have quite a bit of, uh, you know, even higher concentrations of that. Uh, what I thought was noteworthy is that these are not, generally these are not new loans. These are usually pre-pandemic um, and seasoned office loans. So, you know, we'll talk a little bit more, more about that shortly, but uh, just something to kind of keep in mind. Um, and then the hotel and retail kind of rounding out, you know, there's not a lot coming into the deals with this component, um, but, you know, something to keep an eye out for is on those managed deals, the eligibility criteria may allow for those property types to come in at a future date. So it'll be kind of interesting to see, you know, as maybe markets turn or values change, um, you know, if there's some opportunities for people to come in and, and bring those types of loans into these deals. So hey, John, real quick, before mm -hmm. you, you go further, we had a couple questions that I'm, I'm wondering if we it might be a good time to um, answer. Some of the questions were, um, one of them was, what are, if you could talk a little bit, you or Stephen, about eligibility criteria for new loans in the managed deals? And then how do we uh, 
in our analysis, how do we account for the fact that there can be substitutions of, of assets? Um, I think that, you know, this is an interesting question and I think uh, it would be good to see if we could uh, level set now before we talk about some of the things later on. Yeah, and I, I can maybe start with some of the eligibility criteria stuff if Stephen, if you wanna talk about the substitution, but, you know, generally the eligibility criteria are gonna really set guardrails on what type of loans can come in. So there's going to be a couple different, you know, buckets, and that's going to be leverage, LTV. Um, it's going to be diversity of the pool, like, you know, may not be able to go below a, a 14 herf. Um, and obviously, the more, you know, the most obvious one is, is property type, you know, so, you know, you know, if you didn't have certain guardrails, you could say, well, we're going to put in 75% hotels or something like that. So, you know, investors want to have some level of certainty of what those you know, not identified loans would look like in the future. So there's going to be, you know, guardrails and they vary by, you know, by deal types. Um, you also have geography type concentrations um, and limits on that. Um, so that's kind of on the, the eligibility criteria side of things. And then Stephen, do you want to talk about how we uh, model if there's a, a ramp component or a reinvestment com or, you know, the loan ramp component, I guess, specifically what we would do if uh, the full balance of the deal hasn't been uh, allocated to loans. It, and maybe yeah, I so could... I think, yeah, I think it's the, the question kind of, uh, the answer is, is similar um, to John's. Well, and just for substitution, to me, that means, you know, if the issuer is, is buying out a loan, maybe is that what the substitution No, I think substitution just means to? that you're going to end up with different pool than what you start with potentially. So that's not ne necessarily as big a component. I think the interesting part is, you know, talking about maybe dummy loans. Yeah. So similar to what John is saying. So if a deal with uh, a ramp component or even, you know, at uh, and when we do surveillance on transactions, if there's existing cash in the deal that, you know, the issuer can use to, to fund loans, we will look to that, to the the eligibility criteria and, and we'll see, you know, based on leverage requirements or, or property type requirements, we will um, just, yeah, we'll make dummy loans as you, as you noted um, based on, you know, those metrics and we'll try to make it the most conservative we can, you know, so a higher LTV loan, a, a property type that's going to have a, a higher probability of default or, or loss given default. And that's how we'll, we'll finalize the, the pool whether it's you know in, in the ramp component of a, of a deal or if it's um, you know just ongoing surveillance of a transaction as re, re, new reinvestment loans are, are brought into the pools. Great, thank you. Okay, John, sorry, back to yeah. regular scheduled program. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so you know I think just kind of want to dig into the credit considerations for these loans and and with kind of the. You know, the obvious kind of concentrations of multifamily and office, I thought maybe it'd be best to kind of spend some time really kind of digging into those. Um, so starting with multifamily, I would say that, you know, this property type is pretty clean overall. I think we're seeing a lot of, you know, post pandemic originations, you know, you've got new third parties, you've got, um, you know, recent rent rolls, current financials, and obviously uh, a lot of acquisition loans. So, you know, you got back to that, you know, importance of having the, um, the borrower with skin in the game um, up front, and, and this is kind of forward looking, and you, you've kind of don't have the whole problem with you know pre COVID uh, you know originations. Um, so in in the multifamily deals, you're going to have you know generally only two kind of business plans. You're going to have you know prop, uh, a borrower that bought a property that's uh, stabilizing. So it's, you know, it's probably a new building, uh, might be 25% occupied. And, and really now the business plan is just to get them to stabilization. And, you know, we're going to be digging into the market and understanding, you know, new supply and, and just kind of what the, the outlook is for that. And uh, based on, you know, borrowers expectations and appraiser, what that lease up period could look like. Um, but, you know, that one's not that tough to get your head around. Um, the other one would be if a sponsor has a, a capital improvement plan for the property. And they're going to be putting money into common areas, you know, unit uh, upgrades um, with the expectation that that'll translate into higher rents. Um, so when we're looking at that, you know, we can accept, you know, the rent premiums, but we're one thing that we're looking closely at is really what's the spend. You know, if, if it's, you know, less than $5,000, you're probably not going to achieve too much of a rent premium. 
Um, but you start seeing, you know, the fifteen thousand dollar, ten or fifteen thousand dollars, sometimes even higher than that. You know, you're that's where you're really going to probably see some significant pickup um, on cash flow. Um, and I guess what we you kind of seen is that you know those business plans are generally tracking pretty well. Um, hasn't been a whole lot of disruptions um, on on that kind of property type. Um, kind of drilling into you know the market specific parts of uh, apartments. I think generally speaking, most of the apartment markets are performing. They're doing okay. Uh, they're holding up pretty well. Uh, the one exception really is the, the city centers. So the New York, the Chicago, the San Francisco's uh, of the world, you know, that's where vacancies have really kind of spiked very, very kind of short, you know, a very quick spike um, and rents have been declining and there's higher concessions. So, you know, I wouldn't say we see a lot of those loans generally in the CRE CLO space. Um, uh, we see them quite a bit in like, you know, we, we don't see a lot of them even in the Freddie or, or conduit world, but um, that's where we may see those. I don't see them as often here. Um, but, you know, I think forward looking, there is, you know, definitely kind of a expectation that those markets will recover as, you know, the return to the office and people kind of return to the cities. Um, another aspect that we're looking at in, on multifamilies is, is collections. Um, and I can, you know, kind of report that, you know, they've been strong. Uh, we definitely have an occasion, occasional loan here or there where collections have, have been impacted by the pandemic. Um, but by and far, I'd say, you know, collections on multifamily doesn't seem to be much of a concern. Um, but I do think, and one thing that, I, you know, would be very interesting to see how this all plays out is what's going to happen when those enhanced unemployment benefits expire in September of this year. And, you know, is there going to be potential fallout from that? So um, that's something that, you know, we're going to have to kind of all see how that plays out. Hey, John, um, cu coupled with that, because it's interesting that the multifamily having the experience of collection, Paul, we had the, the uh, eviction moratoriums. So we had that at the CDC level. It's been challenged in court, and we've had it in various states where they can't even be evicted. Now you've got the, the as the unemployment comes in and some of the other payments that are going out to individuals that may have helped uh, prop it up, but we have sort of uh, an end of those uh, increased payments as well as uh, a looming into some of the eviction moratoriums where people will be able to be um, evicted. That's right. That's right. Yeah. So, I mean, I think that's like a kind of I mean, even broader macro economy thing is, you know, are, is there some masking of underlying concerns uh, because of some of this uh, uh, some of the, the programs that are out there? So, yeah, it'll be it'll be interesting to see how that plays out. Um, so switching gears to the to the office properties again, this is the one that you know makes up 25, 26 percent or 26 percent of you know, deals so far. Um, and from a value perspective, this is one that's down nearly 10 percent um, from uh, the beginning of the pandemic. So um, hasn't been doing that well, and it seems like the near term outlook is still pretty soft. Um, so as we kind of all know, you know these kind of highlights, but the, there's a lot of factors obviously working against the property type. Um, employers are you know, working from home. They're generally able to do their jobs remotely. So office utilization is down significantly. Um, but what I can say even anecdotally from myself, you know, I came into the office today um, and I've been in the you know, last couple of weeks and those numbers are increasing. Like people are definitely you know, taking public transportation more. There's more people in our office here. Um, Steven's you know, a couple aisles over away from me. Um, you know, so there's, there's more people here. Um, and I think it literally has just kind of started you know, recently with the you know, vaccines and stuff like that. So I think we're, you know, there's, there's you know, maybe a positive outlook for that. Um, as far as the, the city centers, there's a similar trend here with vacancy rates. So um, just like multifamily where those vacancy rates have increased, uh, we are seeing you know, elevated and, and unfortunately quarter over quarter continue, uh, continuing increases in office vacancies. Um, the suburbs haven't you know, gone unscathed either. Those are also um, you know, increasing, but it's, it's not to the same magnitude as the downtown markets. Um, even kind of taking us back to like the the Great Recession, um, office. The downtown office is actually doing worse than what the the Great Recession had, um, and su the suburbs actually are a little bit better than what the Great Recession is. So, um, you know, downtown's really just can, been hit pretty hard um, with that dynamic at play. Now you have landlords that are trying to you know maintain and attract new tenants, um, and to do that, they're obviously you know have to move a couple levers, and that could be. You know, increasing TIs, um, offering more concessions, um, and and those are all 
ultimately kind of, you know, softening kind of the, the outlook for cash flows on these types of properties. Um, and then when we're looking at rent rolls with either near term rollover or um, inquiring about uh, basically these kind of upcoming uh, tenants that might be, you know, trying to understand what that decision is. If they're rolling soon, what are they doing? And what we're kind of getting back is, you know, generally kind of bad news. It's either, you know, short-term lease extension, you know, lower rents, you know, more concessions, um, or in some cases they're just ultimately vacating. So, you know, it, it's usually more to the negative than to the positive. Um, and then on unstabilized office buildings, when we're asking for leasing updates, you know, you might have a 15% occupied office building. You know, when you're asking for the borrower's update on leasing prospects and you're basically getting almost nothing, it's it's kind of tough. But, you know, we also have to realize, you know, this is the tough part of the, the, the cycle for this. Um, and we do have kind of, a, you know, forward looking and, you know, we're not underwriting to trough. We do give some uh, upside if we think it's appropriate. So we're not just, you know, completely saying, well, it's never going to lease up. Um, you know, downtown office markets are also dealing with a lot of, you know, significant uh, sublease overhang. Um, that's probably going to continue for uh, a period of time. Um, I think that the, the actual sublease space kind of coming to the market has subsided a little bit. So, you know, maybe the, the worst is kind of where it is on the sublease space. Um, and I, I did want to kind of maybe just give you guys an example of kind of a common office loan that we're seeing. Um, this would, again, be a, a loan that came prior to the pandemic, was originated prior to the pandemic. Uh, sponsor probably, the property was probably unstabilized at that point in time. And it was the sponsor's plan to, you know, update the property, renovate it, um, and then re-tenant it uh, and bring that oxygen back up. So if this was a pre-pandemic, they might have started some of that actually, you know, vacating tenants or doing their capital plan. And as part of the capital plan, then they're drawing down more future fundings and that loan size is increasing. So now you get to today, you've got a larger loan amount and you're coming to market saying, hey, I've got a bunch of vacant space and I need to stabilize. Well, in today's office market, you know, that's not not really, uh, they're not getting a lot of activity. So, you know, it's, it's, it's kind of a tough story to, to kind of look at and really see how much upside we can give on that. Um, but I would say, you know, I mean, kind of like I had said, like we are able to underwrite upside. And when we're looking at this, it's in market dynamics, it's structured in the loan. Do they have, you know, future fundings, you know, structured into the loan? Um, and just kind of taking into consideration some of those things, we'll, we'll be able to give some upside. One of the things that we do hit um, is either, you know, lack of structure, lack of dollars for future funding. Maybe a borrower that doesn't have enough financial wherewithal to potentially fund some of those dollars if need be. And then the other thing that we've come across is on these season loans, if you only have, um, you know, 18 months until a hard maturity date and it, you're at 15% occupancy in a soft market, you know, you, that's, that's a bind. You're going to be in a pretty tough spot. Um, so we see that on occasion too. Um, with regard to the, you know, kind of the borrower, that is really an important input or a consideration when we're looking at loans and we're looking at borrower's experience with that property type, the market, their financial wherewithal, the skin in the game. And we use that information um, to estimate the DBRS Morningstar business plan score. And that's an input that goes into our model and ultimately helps drive the loan expected loss. So, you know, I think, you know, looking forward, uh, this office performance, you know, right now it doesn't look so great. It's, and it seems to be very dynamic. It's going to be, you know, what ultimately happens, what's going to be the new office environment post the pandemic. You know, there's a lot of things being thrown out there, whether, you know, employees transition to, you know, more of a hybrid model, work from home and part-time and in the office part-time, you know, are we going to have this hoteling concept across office buildings to really drive efficiency of, how much usage is going to be, you know, uh, used in the in the buildings, and if that happens, then potentially they'd be downsizing some of their space, um, or corporate users just moving to more of a hub and spoke approach, um, you know, you know, and then really just how long will it take for the soft office markets to kind of recover? Um, you know, is it is it, you know, I think it's on like it's six months. Is it twelve months? Is it twenty four months? Um, so it's it's really you know, there's a lot of lot more questions than uh, certainty around some of these things. Yeah, I, I think that that's correct. I know, John, you had a, a few more 
points, but I don't want us uh, ice Pat out. So oh yeah, yeah we gotta get to the main I event. Think, <laughs> I think yeah, I was just about ready to wrap up. So no, that's that's good. It's a good transition there. Okay, so uh, Pat, why don't you uh, take it over? We'll move on to the next slide, and this will be the discussion that Pat will lead about legal and structural issues and features. Sure. Thanks very much. And uh, I know to most of the audience, the uh, the property information and performances is the most important. But I think it is it's good to sort of step back and and put the CRE CLOs in in context because the structural and legal um, aspects certainly have an impact on how they perform as well as how uh, investors ought to look at them. And let's start real quickly with some of the differences from a conduit. We've seen conduit out there for years. And now series CLOs, as John mentioned, are, are um, catching up and, and actually passing. But a couple of key things to remember about difference. One is series CLOs have one sponsor, one originator, and they are running the deal. And in fact, they perform a number of roles in the deal from collateral manager, sometimes special servicer, if Rich and his group have signed off, um, and also advancing agents. So they perform a number of, of roles here. Um, second, it's, these are transition loans. They aren't the 10-year fixed rate already uh, um, stabilized loan. So that has an impact and it's a lot more involvement by the sponsor. Um, structurally, these are notes that are issued under an indenture by an SPE issuer. This is not a grantor, or pardon me, a uh, New York common law trust in the conduit. It's a pool and the trust owns the loans. And so they're broken up. The actual term is, is, is passed through certificates, but the issuer owns the loans and it issues notes that are backed by the a pledge of those loans. Um, very critically too, this is therefore not a REMIC. Uh, the REMIC has a lot of restrictions on the ability. You couldn't be adding new loans in and you couldn't do modifying to, um, to performing loans. So. The fact that it's not a REMIC and it's debt for tax is an important difference as well. And therefore, there's also no third party uh, purchaser. It's the sponsor that retains the, uh, the bottom um, and they can be managed or static as, as Stephen and, and John said. So let's go to the first thing here. We're gonna talk about some of the terms and some of the features that, that are a little bit different in how they impact risk retention. So if you remember, if you're around in the industry in, in 2020, 2010, when risk retention was brought about and the actual implementation of that was uh, in 2016. So we've had several years of it, 5% and it was allowed for a B piece fire. Well, I would submit that CRE CLOs are the quintessential risk retention because as Stephen said, anywhere 15 to 20 or 20 plus percent is retained by the issuer. And that's, that, that really covers over a broad um, aspect of how these things are managed is, as we'll talk about some of the changes to the loans that are made. But having a 20% uh, bottom cushion uh, is, is very significant to the uh, incentives of that sponsor. Uh, as was discussed, I'll go to the static managed and lightly managed. Um, the static, you know what's in there. If any of you did uh, investing years ago, you had blind pools or you had the, the, the fixed pools. And the manage does allow the addition, which could not be done in a REMIC during a short ramp up period and then also the reinvestment period, which means investors are not getting principal proceeds. The issuer has the ability to retain those to use to buy other assets. We talked about eligibility criteria, um, John, and, and a key thing in there, at least I think from your perspective, is typically the eligibility criteria for new assets is uh, that DVRS Morningstar gets to have a rack or a review of it to, to approve it going in. So that should certainly give a level of comfort. The only exception from that sometimes is if the participation uh, is already in the pool and it's a smaller number, a million or maybe 5 million, then the, there may not be a rack for addition of, of uh, the acquisition of another portion of that uh, yeah. same participation, right? So. Um, and we talk about the role of the collateral manager. It's the collateral manager who is, again, affiliated with a sponsor who is actually doing the, the purchasing of those loans. And you get, if it's ramp up, you, you, uh, uh, you, know, you have set part of the offering proceeds that are set aside to allow them to do that. The reinvestment period is where it's principal proceeds being re uh, recycling. 
but the collateral managers typically involve a lot of these uh, non-bank lenders are uh, funds and they're subject to the Investment Advisor Act. And so they are regulated. The collateral manager is sort of an additional element is regulated under the Investment Advisor Act. And so they have to be, they're registered and they have to advise them for acquisition of new assets, which is why you'll see the collateral manager feature there for the managed pool and maybe not so much so for the static pool. That comes about, um, the, we, uh, the collateral manager does have a collateral manager standard. So I know structurally, a lot of what's relied upon by the rating agencies investors is the servicing standard for both the servicer and the special servicer, um, <clears throat> which is a duty that's owed to the note holder. The collateral manager has that, but <laughs> the directing holder, which is kind of like the B piece equivalent, does not. And so this is one where you know, I ask you, uh, Rich and others, what how you all view that. Uh, we were very concerned on a conduit side to make sure that the servicing standard override comes into play if there's a decision by the directing holder, the CCR, whatever in the conduit side that um, the servicer determines is contrary to its servicing standard obligation. You have that under the, you have a collateral manager duty of care, but when it's just the directing holder, which is the bottom most class, which is still the same person, right? It's still the, the sponsor in effect, but they don't really have a duty to the note. So how do you, how do you guys look at that? Yeah, you know, I think uh, that's a good point. Um, some of what you've already talked about is sort of the reason why we can get comfortable with that, right? The first thing is the risk retention, the 20%, 15, you know, 18%. That's a significant portion. And so chances are, that align, you know, what is good for that piece aligns with the, the full deal. Um, one of the other things is uh, generally, if we have a new issuer um, who is coming to market, we'll perform uh, an originator review. Um, and one of, you know, lots of the parts of that touch on things such as investment selection, uh, who's the, who are the folks that are on the credit committee that are approving the, the the um, decisions, um, you know, anything that is uh, quality control related, legal related, we get comfortable with the entity. And if we're comfortable with the entity uh, in, you know, the origination and the issuance, then we also look to see, okay, you know, you're, we're comfortable with you to make the, de the decisions for the um, CLO. So uh, ideally, yes, we would prefer to have there be some sort of standard of care, like you're talking about servicer or collateral manager, but in the cases where it might be directing holder that can make certain decisions, um, we are looking at the overall entity and our comfort level with that. Okay, good. Um, the moving down the list, just so we can kind of cover some of these, delayed closed mortgage loans. Again, these are some terms that you won't see in the, in the conduit stuff. And this is mainly because the movement of the timing of these deals. People are, it's kind of like trying to paint the car while it's driving down the road. They're, they're <laughs> trying to build up the pool as, um, uh, as they close the securitization, but loans are not necessarily being closed. So there are some that are expected to be within the window right after uh, the securitization closed, 90 days or so, and those are delayed close. They're usually described in the pool, so that's okay. Uh, there have been a question, we had a question before about, oh, what happens if things change? And a lot of times, um, there's provision in the document to say if there is a material at a change in the terms of the loan, then they come back and get uh, a rack, typically, for example, unless there is um, uh, uh, so that you can look at it again, see whether that change has an impact on the rating that you looked at in connection with the original closing. So that's uh, one aspect of delayed closed mortgage loans. Uh, and it may be that they close even later, so they actually fall into the ramp up period. But an interesting structure in that, in this one, the rating confirmation failure, nobody wants to hear that, but <laughs> it's an interesting structure, I think, because it goes to the ramp up period, uh, the loans that are acquired there. There's two ways that that can be done. Either you get a rack on each loan as it goes through, or it's um, uh, at, within 30 days after the ramp up period, the sponsor comes and says, hey, here are the loans that I bought. I mean, it's kind of like, do you ask permission or do you ask forgiveness, right? So 
Um, and, and so the rating confirmation failure is if they come to you after they've already acquired those assets in the, in the ramp up and, you, and they say, is this okay? And you say, well, no, you, if it's a rating failure and you can't give a no uh, downgrade confirmation, then that's a problem. I'm curious why they have it that it may just be that they want to present it and they're comfortable with the information you've provided so that they won't run afoul of that, but it's a little bit of a, a risk. I want to spend a little time on moving to participation because you don't see participations in, in conduits. And what it, there's a real difference there, of a risk profile that we have to look at and actually have separate representations as to the participation. It means that the, you have one record holder who owns the loan and in whose name the loan is. And then that owner of the loan will issue a participation agreement that says you may participate in the loan. The risk on those things is that you're subject to a bankruptcy risk of whoever has title to that. So that's why, um, but, but they are structured that way often because you hear the future funding uh, participations, right? If you do a, a $50 million loan and you advance 30 at closing, but you've got 20 million of future funding, that's usually done as a retained future funding participation. And so I know what you all look at is the future funding obligor and indemnitor because that person funding in accordance with the loan impacts the loan that's in the pool you just rated, right? So that's an important function there. And so the participation usually keeps the future funding obligation outside of the pool. And if and when it gets funded later on, the ability to acquire it during the uh, ramp up or the investment period is there. But it, it is important and they do add a different risk element. We always look for the holder, the record title holder of that participation to be someone who is either the issuer or a separate institutional custodian or an SPE of sorts, because we want to minimize that, that risk. Um, another big element here is the administrative modifications and criteria based modifications. I don't want to offend anybody, but I'm not sure who came up with the, the terms or how you <laughs> deal with them because they are um, the criteria based modifications also have criteria based modification conditions, which also have uh, EC modification conditions that qualify those dependent upon who gets to make them. And a very important part, and I'll ask this for request in the short time that we have, um, the, those are typically excluded from the servicing standard and there's no rack on. So they're the type of changes and they include things like handling the benchmark changes that'll occur. That's a big issue that we have because it is coming about, LIBOR is going away and we're gonna have a mismatch between LIBOR as provided in the loans and then also in the transactions. So there's the ability to do those kinds of things, but also very importantly, they, the, the administrative modifications include changing debt yield, um, LTV, DSCR, escrow balances, and those kind of things within one of the loans. And granted, these are transition loans, but it is the type of thing that, that could have, um, we understand the flexibility that's desired, but that means that the sponsor and sometimes the DH and sometimes it's the CM, but they have the ability to make those changes typically without um, any kind of RAC or servicing standard application. I don't know if you want to say something about that real quick, uh, Rich. Yeah, you know, I think um, one of the things, you know, some of those things are certainly helpful to have them be specifically mentioned in documents so that you don't have the what happens when, you know, like I'm thinking of the benchmark replacement, you know, that's certainly something that's helpful. Um, some of the other things that you're talking about with criteria based mods, um, they're almost kind of like things that might um, be pre workout type things, right? They're, they're not, you know, if there's an event of default, they can't have these, you know, they're not able to do those kinds of things. So, um, you know, if that, is something that kind of keeps, uh, you know, within guidelines, keeps something uh, performing, you know, like some of the things is, you know, a forbearance would fall under that, uh, that bucket. And I think those are also fine. Um, and, you know, same thing that we're talking about, whoever it is that's doing this, we're, we're probably comfortable with them because we've reviewed them through some sort of at risk review. Yeah, and I think also, as was stated before, I think Stephen noted that, that the, the special servicing is lower here relative to conduit. And a big part of that is we need to remember the sponsors here are looking to the CRE CLO as an alternative to a, a repo line 
for a warehouse line, which has often has a lot more rigid um, uh, parameters, and they're, they want to manage it. So if they see something and they want to keep it outstanding, so if they see something happen with a loan, they may buy it out or fix it, but they want to manage it so they don't ever hit a trigger to uh, cause a, a rapid amortization. So that, that, that flexibility, particularly with the 20% cushion, makes sense. I want to hit real quick as we're coming to an end. Controlling class, one thing here, we usually think about that in conduit as the controlling class rep or as the bottom. But because this is an indenture deal, if you ever have an issuer default, that's to be distinguished from one or more of the loans going into default. If you have an issuer default, then the controlling class gets to tell the trustee what to do for remedies, which may be sell all the collateral. But that's a different from what's used in this term, which is either the directing holder or the subordinate class representative, which are the, the sponsor in effect, but it's the BP. So the senior class, which is the controlling class, does have certain rights, but it's only when things go to an issue or default. No protection tests. I know that uh, Stephen talked about that and they are they're fairly standard in those deals. They talk about interest coverage and they talk, talk about par value coverage. Another element, um, the deferred interest notes, which is sort of interesting, obviously be careful about that because some of the deals have that, which means you all rate timely uh, interest and ultimate principal. But on deferred interest notes, usually those are the class C, D, or E. A and B are typically, there's advancing on those and, they're, and you're rating timely pay. Deferred interest, it just means it's ultimate payment of interest and ultimate payment of principal because those things, the interest will be added on at the end and um, uh, it will accrue interest, but there, it's different. Another sort of interesting element too, not uh, that has to do with interest. Some of these things have step ups. So after three years, there may be a step up by 25 basis points in these deals. That's an interesting feature of the CRE seal is that you don't see. We, we talked about tax treatment, non-REMIC that gives great flexibility and uh, um, it does mean you either have offshore in the Cayman Islands or the issuer has to be a QRS, which is qualified REIT subsidiary. The last thing I'll hit in the last, oh, I've gone over already, sorry, is the, the, the reporting side. So Crefsi does a good flow for Crefsi, obviously. They do a fantastic job with the IRP and that is being worked on to adapt to some of the differences that you've just heard on this presentation today. Um, that CRE CLOs have. So that is in the works uh, and get involved if you're interested. So Absolutely. I did. Sorry, I went over. No, no worries. You know, we kind of put you under the gun and didn't give you enough time. Well, um, the hour kind of, I don't know, from my perspective, the hour kind of flew by. So hopefully everybody enjoyed. And, um, you know, uh, if you have any questions, uh, reach out to any of us. And like I said, the, the slide deck and a replay will be forthcoming from the business development team. So thank you everybody and have a good rest of your Wednesday. All right, thanks. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you.